Coming up on episode 25 of the R Podcast, we wrap up our coverage of our Studio Comp 2018 with another great interview. I talk with Ian Little about his personal journey to using R, the value that Shiny brings and then communicating with customers at his work, and some of his new packages to ease the pain of working with enterprise GitHub installations. I will also discuss my key insights and takeaways from the extending Tinyverse training as well as the talks that I attended. I hope you enjoy this jam-packed episode of the R Podcast. Episode 25 starts now. everyone welcome back to another episode of the art podcast my name is eric and it's great to be talking with you again i wanted to get this episode out a couple weeks earlier but i hate to say it but the flu uh totally ravaged my household and i was out of commission from doing any uh podcasting for a good few weeks there it was a nasty one and yes i guess flu shots are not that effective this year but anyway i am Almost back to normal, at least normal enough to talk to you guys today. So I'm going to use this episode to put a wrap on our coverage of our Studio Comp 2018. After the main segment, I'm going to share my insights from both the training and the talks that I've attended, as well as a lot of the other nice roundups from other people in the community, as well as uh, some of the other parts of the conference I really enjoyed. But let's not wait any longer. Let's start with my conversation with Ian Little. All right, welcome back, everybody. And as I mentioned in previous episodes, I really enjoy going to these conferences because one of the biggest reasons I enjoy it is I am reconnecting with old friends and making new acquaintances, but I have the pleasure today of welcoming uh, someone I've met actually in a couple previous conferences and one of the people I admire in the community, Ian Little. So Ian, thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So for those of our listeners who may not have heard about you, can you tell us a bit about your background and your journey to how you got to using R? One of the things I've, I've learned about the, the data science community is that there's uh, a lot of folks who did not uh, train as a data scientist, if you will, that they've mm -hmm. had previous lives and, and come into data science. And uh, learning that, I was very relieved because I'm one of these people. Um, <laughs> I, I trained as a mechanical engineer, uh, did uh, grad school work on uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, looking at what happens at high energy gases on uh, like on a re-entry vehicle, uh, so pretty esoteric. And as I came out of grad school, uh, I went to, to work at Schneider Electric, who do circuit breakers. And when a circuit breaker opens up, when, you, when a short circuit happens, a, a, a uh, circuit breaker opens up, creates an electric arc, and this too is high temperature gases. And so I went to work for the first few years at Schneider to do simulations on this uh, high temperature electric arc. Uh, but then in the past few years, our group moved out of, uh, of this area and more into this data science realm. And as we, I came to discover uh, R, for example, and then came to uh, discover ggplot2, and then I was immediately hooked and saw then that Hadley Wickham's name pop up over and over again with, <laughs> uh, in those days, ply R and yep. uh, reshape2 and... Uh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, to give a bit more background that uh, I work out of the Schneider office in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And I was super pleased to, to find out, although he had left by that point, that Hadley had, had done, as, as everyone knows, his, uh, his graduate work at Iowa State. 
and uh, he was kind enough to introduce me to uh, professors uh, Di Cook and uh, Heike Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the highlights of my job is every so often to go out to Ames and to, to exchange with the, the graphics group out there. Oh, what's, what's new? What's cool? What are you doing these days? And it's, uh, um, uh, so this is my sort of long and winding road to, uh, to sitting in front of, <laughs> of you at our <laughs> studio conf. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I think um, things, obviously visualization is one of the biggest hooks of learning R itself as compared to some of the other statistical computing packages. Um, some don't have quite as great graphic capabilities. Um, so when you were starting to learn R, what were some of the weird issues that you had to kind of work your way around to understand the language better and to use it effectively? I, I remember um, rank versus order. Okay. That was, I know it's a very specific one, and I remember spending a half a day trying to sort this out for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I'll come back to it, and I still have to spend half a day <laughs> <laughs> sorting out <laughs> rank versus order. Um, Hadley's done a really good job of, of pointing out here are, you know, R may seem strange, but here's why. Mm -hmm. And here's why it was done this way, and uh, here's maybe where it could be improved. Uh, but I think uh, as well, sort of the community that uh, uh, that, that Hadley is, has has uh, seemed to have brought up around himself in our studio have brought up as well mm -hmm. that it makes it so much easier when you know that there's there's other people in the same boat and you can right. be uh, you know not not quite as a uh, you can let your guard down a bit and and <laughs> uh, ask the silly questions. Yes, yes, that's actually a, a topic I've talked about in a previous segment is getting connected with the community, but letting kind of your guard down a little bit and not being afraid, not necessarily fail, but to learn through doing and the community in general is extremely helpful to point you in the right direction, get you connected with other resources, but it's quite welcoming. So for those that are new to R, um, you, you may hear this in, say, the Twitterverse or other venues that the R community is quite welcoming. That's not, that, that's for legit. That is real. I mean, we yeah. see this when we're at these conferences. Experience levels of all user types, you know, from the newer ones to the old timers like me. I mean, we're all in the same boat. We're all learning something new. So it's, it's great to hear that you've, you've experienced similar things. Oh, yeah. Yep. So one of the things I know that you've been working on is that you develop Shiny applications. In fact, we first met at the Shiny yes. DevCon a couple of years ago, and it seems like it is a key part of your day-to-day -day work, or at least has been. Um, so you tell, could you tell us a bit about the role that Shiny plays in, say, how you communicate results and enabling your colleagues to look at some, gain some insights from your statistical analyses with data science? Well, the biggest project I've worked on with Shiny at, uh, at work is where we have this problem of wanting to make our web services available, that if we have some sort of algorithm that we make mm -hmm. available through a web service. Mm -hmm. um, and as I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate, there's a bit of a chicken and egg um, issue going on with web services in, in general, that mm -hmm. if you want to see, if you wanted to to figure out if you want to devote the time to write a client to this web service to, to use it, mm -hmm. you have to go through and write a client to the web service to find out <laughs> if you want to write a client to, so, so it's a, it right. becomes very circular. Right, right. And so what we did was for a, a series of, um, uh, we call them components, uh, for a series of components, which would be collections of web services, we'd put together a shiny site that would say, here is what this component does, upload this data, hit this button, and mm -hmm. you'll see here's the data going in, here's the data coming out. Mm -hmm. And if this is something that interests you or your development team, you know, call, call this person and we'll, uh, we'll get you hooked up. Okay, okay. And uh, so this, this was a, uh, a great way that you know, we put these de um, demonstrators together in a, in a matter of, of weeks and it, it went a long way uh, towards you know, even conversation starters at internal conferences where we could say, here's what this thing does, let me show you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. One of the things I've, that's enabled me to do is to save myself a ton of effort 
in, say, meetings with key executives or, or key leadership or just even teams on a project where before we would have to say, if someone said, okay, I like what you did, but can you change that variable to that one? Or can you give me that summary statistic? And the old days, we'd have to go back, reprogram it, compile the PDF table or whatever, and go back and have another meeting. If for me, it's streamlined that whole collaboration review process, where I think I've had one project that saved like four or five meetings just because we had a simple Simple UI, not complicated by any means. You, you would have been, it would have been trivial to someone like you as an expert at this, but, it, um, but just those little, in, those little improvements to your overall processes are one of the biggest wins, I think, with technology like this and that you and I don't have to be expert JavaScript CSS wizards to be able to get something going really quickly. Yep, I, I think any time you can save your customer time in yep. understanding what you do, uh, Everyone wins. Exactly, exactly, yep. So um, is alongside I think your Shiny development, you've developed some interesting packages in the R community. Um, one in particular I've used recently is uh, BS+. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you've been able to get that going and what was the motivation there? Uh, that actually came out of the uh, Shiny demonstrators that, uh, that we were just talking about mm -hmm. is we, uh, I was wanting to find just a nice, clean interface to, to be able to show a whole bunch of things at once and uh, wanted to create some more real estate on, a, on, your, on your shiny web page. Mm -hmm. And so I messed around a bit with, uh, with Bootstrap mm -hmm. and saw that there is some, if, if you wrote the HTML just so that you could do some, some fancy things. Mm -hmm. And as we made more and more of these demonstrators, I thought, okay, I need to write a function. You know, the, the, the old Hadley rule, <laughs> yes. if you're copying and pasting three, more than twice. More than three. three times, bam, you got it. You got yourself yeah. right. And then <laughs> I, I think that scales up that if you're uh, writing that function more than a few times, mm -hmm. it's time to write a package. Yep. And this is how it came about. And I noticed that uh, there was a lot of patterns that were appearing in the Twitter bootstrap API, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, these folks have put a lot of thought into this. How can I, they, so the question I asked myself was, how could I make a direct path from the R user to what the bootstrap people are doing and just try to get out of the way of it? Okay. Uh, and so be able to pass in uh, as many arguments as you could through dot, 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 and mm -hmm. try to, and, emulate the, the philosophy that I figured that they were trying to show mm -hmm. and say, and just try to sort of step back and, and as I say, not get in the way. Uh, sort of the, the, the joke I made at, uh, at Use R during a, um, a lightning presentation was, uh, you want me to do as little as possible. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get the, uh, you as the R developer, uh, hooked up with a Twitter bootstrap with as little interfer interference from me as, as possible, because I'll just right. mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been there. I've, I've had radical plans, and it's like if you do too much or get in the way too much, then, yeah, your, your customers or, or your people you work with are not going to be too thrilled about it. Yep, absolutely. But I, I certainly want to thank you for making that package because it's really supercharged my apps, oh, excellent. Es especially the tooltip feature. You have no idea how much rave reviews that has gotten. Oh, I am. I, that's, I'm, <laughs> I'm stoked to hear that. That's yeah, great. it's just one of those things where it's an input that as you develop an app, it makes total sense to you that they would put in this number for this quantity, um, some like criteria for benchmarking success. But then we had kind of a mathematical formula that these numbers are kind of plugging into, and it's easy to mess that up if you don't quite know, say, the direction of the greater or less than sign. So in this app I made, I just simply did a tooltip to just plug that number into an equation just to let them hover over it, make sure they're like, okay, that means it's successful or that one means it fails. So just little nuggets like that. I mean, I don't know if they seem powerful to you, but man, they were powerful to us. So <laughs> yep. thank you so much. Oh, no, no, no problem. <laughs> that came from a um, sort of an internal review process where uh, 
one of my colleagues uh, said, you know, it would be great if we could have a tooltip here. And I would, oh, grumble, grumble, grumble. OK, I'll <laughs> grumble, grumble, grumble. <laughs> been there, been there. They, they, you know, a lot of them just don't know the, how something's easy or difficult it is to build some of these features. So anytime we have a package, it kind of just brings that in. It makes less work for people like me to, have to yep. do complicated backends too. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the things I've enjoyed about, uh, about my job is that mm -hmm. certainly that there are things that I do and my <coughs> colleagues do that we have to keep private within uh, within the company. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but if there's things that we're doing, like tooltips, that could mm -hmm. make things easier for the community, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a great way to do the right thing. Right. Uh, but also, it's a uh, a great conversation starter with. Uh, you know, with the Eric Nances of the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's humbling. <laughs> and, it, uh, uh, and it's just a it's just a win win that uh, we have certainly benefited from the open source stuff that uh, you know everyone has done. Absolutely. And so to be able to participate in some small way in in contributing is uh, uh, is is one of the things that makes. Uh, my job satisfying. Yes, absolutely. I've, you know, I'm in a similar situation where I'll probably 90% of the work I do cannot see the light of day outside the firewall, so to speak. So I'm always looking for ways to get involved. And of course, my passion is shiny APIs and looking at interesting data sets from online. So I'm going to try and do more of that as the year goes on. Um, one of the things I've told people that maybe are new to shiny is that maybe you have a different opinion on this, but I've always thought of it having its own DSL or domain specific language within R itself, but it requiring a slightly different skill set, especially when it comes to debugging an application, yes. ma making it robust enough for quote production, however that's defined to you. So in general, what advice do you have to those that have heard about Shiny, they're, they're all in, they wanna help their company or wherever they're working, mm -hmm. uh, create innovative applications. What advice do you have for them to get started? You know, I hate to give advice that, hey, it worked for me, so I'm going to tell everyone else to do it. <laughs> but it worked for me, so I'm going to tell everyone you else bet. to do it. You bet. Yep. Okay. That get stuck in. It's going to be confusing, uh, gratifying, frustrating, you know, the whole range of emotions. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you're going you're gonna to go through it all. And you're going to get a sort of a sense of how the, the shiny verse works. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, if you get a spare afternoon or something, I would really recommend that you um, uh, go to the R Studio website, and uh, you were there uh, at the Shiny DevCon, where Joe yep. sat down for the morning and said, all right, here's how Shiny actually works. Yes. And yes. I had been going through this process of, uh, of developing these, these Shiny demonstrators, and uh, it was just a revelation that I saw every single thing that Joe said, here is what you shouldn't do and here's why you shouldn't do it. <laughs> I could remember exa doing exactly that and oh, it made yes. sense. This is why you shouldn't do it. Right. And then he sort of walked us through, here is how it actually works and here is how you should think of it. Mm -hmm. and, and it just totally changed my shiny development philosophy. And, and it was, I, I think of before that, talk and after that talk. Um, but I don't think that you can really appreciate that talk until you've gotten in and, and sort of got your elbows scraped up on, uh, on making a few apps. So yes, uh, yes. but I, that's, uh, that's definitely, uh, that's the advice I give is, is get some experience and then at some point, uh, go watch that talk, sit down for an afternoon or a morning or, or whatever it happens to be, and then just hopefully the, the clouds will part. <laughs> <laughs> I had very similar um, impressions as you did because I've, I made a lot of, you might not now look at his bonehead mistakes in my earlier apps, and then when he took reactivity and just drilled down to the nuts and bolts of it, which if you can get your handle on that, and as you said, I, I totally agree, watch the, the videos from that conference because yep. that is the one place where he, that was his mission that conference yes. is to talk to us for more than a few minutes about how this stuff really works. That is powerful. I wish I could remember verbatim the haiku. Uh, 
Oh, right. Well, that'll be a, for the listeners to find yes. out. But yes, he had, he had a few powerful haikus and idioms in there. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, again, that that's uh, awesome advice. And the other thing I'll mention too, is that as you go from say prototyping to having a more large scale application that encompasses a lot of different parts, um, definitely take a look at modules. Modules ah, yes. are like the it is, it actually, that's what I wanted to talk to you about because you actually had one of the very first packages that actually was a module released to the community. So you definitely put it, paid it forward when you learned about it. Well, <laughs> at, at, at this, this, this too came out of this, yep. uh, these, what we called it uh, at our company, these shiny demonstrators. Uh, okay. This was, we were doing the same thing over and over again that we needed a module that would uh, would call an API or mm -hmm. we needed a module that did this and we needed to compose them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was that was some great timing that uh, mm -hmm. came about there. Absolutely, I remember. Yeah, you gave a presentation about that at the conference, and I'm like, where has this been? Because <laughs> I was doing a whole bunch of spaghetti kind of linking between functions and not knowing what was what or passing stuff back and forth, and that's been a huge help to supercharge my oh excellent large scale apps. And I got Joe seems pretty. Um, happy with it although there's some shortcuts i made as always you know, <laughs> you know how it goes <laughs> yeah exactly that stays between you and us yes. no one listens to this no one <laughs> so um yeah this has been awesome talking with you ian um what are some of the newer things you're working on in in the art community that you'd like to talk about if anything sure um i am looking forward to giving this presentation uh at the in a couple of days here at yep. the uh, our studio conference it's a package called genter G H E N T R. Ooh. Okay. And uh, the it's based on GitHub Enterprise. So the G H E N T is GitHub Enterprise, and oh. then R just because you need to stick an R in your package somewhere. Yeah, somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the motivation is that um, through Dev Tools and Use This, we have got a we as a community have a a wonderful way of installing from you know install underscore github mm -hmm. use underscore github and it just think, makes things absolutely painless right right and if you have github enterprise at work and you want to be able to do the same thing or or potentially even try to create an r community with within your company mm -hmm. that both use this and install github have an argument host yes. that you can then point at your, your corporate or whatever your GitHub enterprise is. Okay. But if you want to use it, you have to type in host equals, so on and so forth. Right, right. And that becomes a bit painful. So what I did a couple of years ago for, uh, at my company is made a package, that, like an internal Schneider tools package, if you will. Sure. And a couple of the functions in this are use GitHub SE for Schneider Electric and install GitHub SE that wrap those host arguments. Mm. So you would use the specific fu function for, for Schneider just mm -hmm. as easily as you'd use GitHub, or pardon me, use, use underscore GitHub yeah. or install underscore GitHub for the regular GitHub. Okay, yep. All right, and I'm sorry, this is a, a way longer setup than you were, <laughs> you were probably- <laughs> No, I enjoy it, don't worry, yeah. <laughs> probably hoping for. <laughs> so the thing is that the, the function that I use and that we use at Schneider to talk to Schneider GitHub is 99.9% .9 similar as you might use if you had install GitHub Eli. Yep. If you will. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that changes is that host argument. Mm -hmm. So it'd be mm -hmm. really convenient for you just to be able to template that function and say, I want to set up a function called use GitHub e yeah. Eli. Sure, sure. You supply the argument once, you get the function, put it in your package, and uh, now you make that function available to all of your colleagues. Oh, okay. okay. So it's, it's one of these... It's a package that I think will be directly used by maybe, I'm guessing a, maybe 100 people, if you will. But I'm hoping for that for those 100 people that it makes their life a lot easier to, to use GitHub within their companies and, and make things easier for you know, their, each of their communities. 
Well, that, is, that is awesome to hear. I'm definitely going to check, check that one out. I think this brings to a kind of a bigger issue that I'm going to be on, I won't say a crusade on, but it's going to be one of my themes as I continue this podcast is there hasn't been a lot of voice about some of the issues that those of us in a, whether it's a small or a large company, enterprise, however you want to call it, we have to deal with little, little things that those that are in different industries or say in academics or don't necessarily have to deal with. And sometimes I feel like, yeah, there isn't as much attention to how we can leverage our effectively in these more complicated setups. So this is just one example of if you're, at, you're fortunate enough to be in a company that does version control the right way, has things deployed in their firewall, this could be a, an excellent way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's also an opportunity that one of the things I really enjoy about uh, about these conferences, we, uh, our studio comp or, or use our, mm -hmm. is that that sense of, of community. Right. And that if, if there are tools that, I think that there is a an opportunity for, for each of us who might be working in a company to to take the lessons uh, from, from Hadley and from mm -hmm. Joe and from JJ and uh, from academia uh, who have built up this community and, and, and Establish versions of that in at our own places. Right, absolutely. No, it's it's a very excellent development. I'm looking forward to seeing that come come through. So, um, yeah, for our listeners that want to uh, get in touch with you, follow up what you're doing. What are the best ways that they can reach you? I am on Twitter at IJ Little, which mm -hmm. is spelled L Y T T L E, mm -hmm. and uh, my uh, GitHub handle, similarly I J L Y T T L E. Awesome. Awesome. Well, well, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today, and um, we'll definitely be in touch. As, well, thank as we go you. It's, a, it's been a great pleasure, and I've uh, been looking forward to this. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot, Ian, and um, everyone. We'll be right. We'll be back right after this. Thanks. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed our talk with Ian that I just played for you. I've, um, as I mentioned in that top of the interview, I've actually met him at uh, a couple of different conferences, and I've always been very uh, impressed with his technical knowledge, but also how personable he is, and so easygoing and very easy to talk to, and yeah, it's just one of those, again, that's another example of how welcoming the community is, and it's so easy to establish friendships, and great uh, collaborations along the way. And um, Ian and I definitely shared some fun moments uh, before that interview as well as afterwards. Um, I'm not sure if he's going to like me saying this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway because I, I thought it was funny. Before we actually talked, I had noticed that uh, a good friend of the show that you just heard from last time, uh, Iwe Sia, um, had a very interesting thought about how prepared Ian is for these conferences. So, um, don't take my word for it. Go find uh, Eway's blog, and you'll, you know, you'll see that. But uh, I thought that was great. But apparently, I was the one to break the news to Ian about that <laughs> that post being up there. So, Ian, sorry I couldn't resist. Hope you still talk to me after this. So, anyway, I, I mean, all these uh, talks I've had at our studio conf with people in the community, both those that I met before, as well as some new. New members that I met has been really fascinating. And again, probably the best part of the whole conference is just meeting all these people. So, so yeah, I hope you enjoy those interviews. Um, I admit I've been kind of wearing multiple hats when I go to these conferences, both from just being an R enthusiast like, like I am and trying to get insights that I can bring back to my, my daily work, as well as, of course, my explorations of R in general. It was exhausting, for sure. Everything is pretty intense, but again, it wouldn't take anything back. Um, I, again, I enjoyed every minute of it. And I must say, I'm very humble to have the opportunity to be able to attend the conference as well as attending the previous versions of this, even from the very beginning with the Shiny DevCon, albeit that was a different focus. but. I definitely don't lose sight of how fortunate I am to be able to pull that, pull that off. And at the very least, I hope I can bring some of this um, interesting insights to you, uh, the listener. I definitely put on my other hat as the ambassador, one of the ambassadors, I should say, of the Art Weekly Initiative, 
which if you haven't heard about it by now, definitely check out rweekly.org for some great uh, roundups of, of interesting happenings, interesting posts from the R community. I brought along a whole bunch of stickers and I definitely gave a few away. Um, but at the very least, I spread the word and hopefully we get more contributors down the road. But anyway, it was good fun to spread the, the, good, the goodwill of our weekly at the, our studio conf. So that's for kind of my general thoughts of the conference itself. As I kind of mentioned previously, it was definitely bigger than last year. Um, so far, the estimates I'm hearing is that they were about at least a thousand attendees, maybe even more so than that. In terms of how it compares to last year, I've run of course, the bigger number. I do think they set things up a little more optimally this year from not just the tracks themselves during the conference, um, but also one of the things that I, along with others, I get feedback about is we really wanted to start networking with others that maybe were in similar industries in terms of our daily work. And yeah, you always find ways to have ad hoc meetings at conferences. I mean, that's always been a important thing for networking. But I admit, I'm not the best at those things. But what they did this year is they organized what they called birds of a feather sessions. And one of them was definitely tailored to the industry I'm in. So I met some people I've been collaborating with before and obviously some new people. But we were able to talk about a lot of the issues that we're going through share some insights and part of it was kind of validation for me because what I'm doing internally at work is mostly on par with what the best practices are in terms of organizing a community of our users, giving them resources to get started and giving them ways to level up their skill set. So I feel like I'm on the right track, but yeah, I've learned a lot of other things along the way through what other people were saying they were struggling with or things like that. But, but I'm, I'm hoping that, that next year's conference, if I'm fortunate enough to go again, that we have uh, similar setups for those sessions. I think they were quite valuable. My only regret is not being able to go to other ones, but I had to take that opportunity when I could. It was um, set aside, I believe, on the Thursday night or Friday night of, of the conference, but they all had them going at the same time. But in any event, I definitely tried to use that time to my advantage. Um, some other general thoughts um, in terms of what was really interesting uh, insights that I got. Well, uh, my first um, part of the conference, I was attending the Tidyverse, extending the Tidyverse training taught by Hadley Wickham himself. And of course, I feel like that's one little check off my R bucket list, if you will, of being able to attend a course that Hadley teaches because I've heard about them. I've seen some recaps of them or some previous recordings of a couple, but um, there, it was just fascinating to see how we uh, structured the material and especially how he was able to adapt kind of things on the fly and figure out, oh, you know, I should maybe dive into that more often, or he would modify things directly in the slides to be able to recap things or, you know, based on the feedback we were asking about. So um, am I going to say that I'm a full-blown tidyverse um, master in terms of developing things? Probably not yet, but I admit I was there for you know, obviously to learn about the tidyverse more, but there was one particular aspect that I was really interested in, and that was the idea of tidy evaluation. And I feel like with respect to Hadley's training this in this conference, I think he, along with colleagues I'll mention next, have pretty much nailed down how they want to approach this. And this is not his first effort in doing so but I think he's got the framework now where he can start standardizing on it and be able to make resources that explain it in not only the theoretical details, but hopefully the practical details too. Um, he's definitely started that by adding some new chapters to his um, second edition of the Advanced R book that he is working on, and those are available online. I'm happy to, in fact, I will put links to those in the, in the show notes so you can quickly go to those chapters if you're interested. 
But yeah, I definitely asked some things um, about the tidyverse philosophy, such as um, what were some good examples of packages that we could emulate from that really use things like S3 classes to its fullest potential. So he gave some good examples of that. Um, but the other nugget I got, and again, that kind of relates to the tidy evaluation piece, is that everything you do in R in terms of interacting with like even the, the, the prompt or through your scripting, everything is produced as a abstract syntax tree. Now, I admit I had no idea what that meant when he first started it, but there's an interesting way to kind of visualize this in real time when you're working with this stuff. He's made a new package that's still in development on GitHub called Lobster, that's L-O-B-S-T-R, and it gives you a nice way to print in the console output what your call to R, no matter how simple or how complicated it is, how it translates to this kind of syntax tree. It's a good way for you to kind of practice how R thinks of almost everything as a function, even the parts that you don't expect. So where tidy evaluation kind of comes in is that you're going to be dynamically putting things in parts of the syntax tree, in essence overriding it with however you want to define it without compromising anything else in the evaluation environment. That is a very gross oversimplification, but the, part, the other part I found funny was that we had a lot of interactive exercises during the training, which is Hadley's style for sure. And when we got to that part, he had us work through what it seemed like it was a pretty complicated example, but I literally was typing away at the, the notes he was giving us from the slides, and lo and behold, I got it right the first time. But it was funny, I was sitting next to a friend of the show and my colleague, uh, Will Landau. He's, he's the author of the Drake Package, and definitely check out the back catalog from a previous episode where I talked to Will about that package. But he and I were sitting next to each other throughout the training. And I turned to him and I said, hey, I got it right, but I have no idea why. <laughs> That's, it's very rare that after using R for, what is this now, uh, 12, 13 years, if not longer, that I have that feeling of like stepping into a pit of success, but not knowing how I did it. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm happy that I'm on the right track, but I need to sit down with the examples a little more to really um, reinforce the concepts that Hadley taught. But it was extremely valuable if nothing else, to be able to get into the mindset of what Hadley has done with structuring the Tidyverse suite of packages. And he had some excellent TAs that were in the course as well. Um, Kara Wu, I haven't met her before, but she was very knowledgeable, very helpful. And uh, Lionel Henry um, also has been a big architect of a lot of the Tidy evaluation work, and it was great to meet him in person. And hear some of his insights, but he has he has an interesting backstory too because I don't he doesn't seem to have been formally trained in computer science. Um, he was brought up in statistics like a lot of us were, but he has really um, stepped up his knowledge of how to work with these very complicated concepts like tidy evaluation and many other of the back end components of the tidyverse. But it was great to meet him in person and I'm really impressed with the work he is doing. So so yeah, the Tidyverse training was very, very valuable. Um, there were definitely other great trainings I of course cannot attend, but I've heard great things about them from the Shiny training over to teaching about the Tidyverse from an educational perspective. Uh, I heard Garrett also did an excellent job with that. So, of course, at, at each night of the conference, we had, you know, mix, various mixers of show, social events and definitely some cool stuff this year. Um, I remember we had um, a little get together mixer event uh, at the hotel itself on top of one of the roofs in the buildings. And we had some really great conversations. I remember in particular, I was talking with uh, Joe Chang and a few other shiny enthusiasts about some of the new stuff coming up, but also some other issues like 
how does Shiny compare with some of the newer efforts like Dash in the Python community? But it was great to hear uh, Joe's perspective on it. We, you know, definitely talk about some complicated stuff. And um, yeah, I always am a geek about hearing hearing what goes on behind the scenes of, of his team and kind of the stuff they're working on. So that was a great conversation. I had, I had many others as well. So definitely a shout out to everybody that I met for the first time. It was great stuff. So getting to the conference itself in terms of the presentations, um, both of the keynotes on the on the day one and day two were really well done. Um, D. Cook gave a great keynote about the tidyverse principles and how they can help illustrate and augment statistical inference and in a nice visual kind of way that really puts in perspective things like type one errors and other what can be complicated concepts like the concepts of resampling permutation distributions it was so cool to see that those you might say traditional concepts are quite powerful though but blending that statistical foundation with i mean i i guess there are better ways to say it but like some of the newer principles with respect to data science and in particular in the r space the tidyverse and how they can really play well together. And sometimes I feel like with all the press that Tidyverse gets, that sometimes we don't give enough credit to some of the foundational statistical pieces that can be quite valuable as we work with data and work on interpreting results and communicating them effectively. So I, I've never seen a D. Cook uh, present before, but that was an uh, excellent keynote. And one thing I'll mention too is that at the time I'm recording this, the sessions, the recordings of each of the presentations are now online on the R Studio site. So you have the chance to relive what some of us saw in person. And, and I'm also being able to relive the stuff I did not get to see in person because there were multiple tracks and I can't be at three places at once. So I had to choose, uh, you know, sometimes the hard decisions on which one to go in person. But again, and the other keynote was from J.J. Allaire, who is, of course, the, the founder of our studio, talking about the newer advancements with respect to machine learning, deep learning, and TensorFlow in particular. So I have not really had the chance to dive into this stuff myself, but believe me, I am intrigued by how this can really augment and demystify some of the concepts of deep learning, but also make it very practical for all of us, our users, to kind of get started with this and try it out ourselves. There was one particular component of the demonstration that he showed kind of a real-time visualization of model performance and then being able to show within the RStudio IDE as like these learners are being, you know, formed and executed, how the model metrics are being updated in real time. It was in essence a real time graph showing the values of um, an error rate or something to that effect. But the fact that we can see all this and it's highly performant, it's, it, it is really intriguing to be able to, bend of, to dive into some of this stuff. So um, he actually has a book that he's co-authored that talks about deep learning with R that ironically I had purchased um, about a month before the conference. And unfortunately it came in the mail right after I left. So I couldn't get him to autograph it, but that's okay. I'll, I'll get that next time. But I have it on my bookshelf to kind of dive into if I have the time to dive into a project that involves uh, deep learning down the road. So yeah, lots of other great talks that I attended. Um, one of them in particular that I remember very well was um, talks that you know were around educating others with R. Definitely saw a presenter, Marco, give a great talk about empowering users with data camp within his organization, which I believe was talking about sports uh, betting, which again, is not the field I'm in, but hey, it, but the principles that he was using were very, very well done and how they power their internal community to contribute after they learn something with projects and kind of give incentives for people to learn more as they go along. 
but he, like me, is one of those that has a data camp kind of enterprise group, and he was able to keep track of the metrics for what data camp offers. But the funny story behind this is that data camp itself, when they give you this um, metadata in terms of the people in this custom group that you administer, it's, um, well, get this, the results are outputted as um, Excel spreadsheets and not very clean Excel spreadsheets. And um, it's ironic because David Robinson, who has um, was at the conference too. He has just joined Data Camp as of a month or two ago. And um, after the talk, I had a chance to run into David um, just by good luck. And um, after hearing Marco's talk, I told him, well, you know, Marco's right. Those spreadsheets are pretty unwieldy and it takes a while to tidy them up. And he was, he was floored by that. So <laughs> I think I have a future collaboration with David of, at data, uh, now at Data Camp to look over those formats and maybe we can work on making a more tidy version of all that. So just some interesting stuff that get to see other people experience what I experience and we might be able to get some improvements on that down the road. So stay tuned if you're a Data Camp group administrator about those things. So yeah, um, there are lots of other talks. Um, you, you guys, you, everybody who listens to the podcast know that I am a total, um, totally uh, addicted and a geek about Shiny. So there was great talks from Joe Chang himself about using asynchronous processes within Shiny apps. That is now getting pretty close to production. It's not quite there yet, but boy, is that going to be important for a lot of our apps that are doing a lot of complicated user interactions and back-end processes to be able to parallelize that and not bog down the rest of the app because it's waiting for one single thing. So that, stay tuned for that. It's coming up, and boy, that's going to be a game changer for a lot of my apps. Um, also, Winston Chang gave a great talk about regression testing within Shiny via the new Shiny test package which I am now just starting to give a spin in my apps. And so far, at least for a simple app, it seems to be working. So the, the key part will be how I roll this into my more um, enterprise, massive, big, big, big app that I just created a year or so ago. I'm not sure if it's going to be able to play nice with that, but boy, I'm going to try and find out. But yeah, lots of other interesting talks. Um, Definitely one that was a big hit was uh, Ehue's uh, talk about blog down. You heard a, a little bit about that in the last episode, but at the end of that presentation, he blew everybody away with uh, admittedly a little bit of trickery, but boy, it was fun to watch. So um, I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it yet. You'll want to watch the recording of that. It was, I think it got the most uh, applause or you know excitement out of any talk at, in that little demo he did. So that was, that was cool stuff. You know, really, you know, lots of other talks. I probably am going on a little long here, but um, the other cool parts about all this is that you start to see people that either I personally followed or, of course, many others have followed and be able to start collaborations. And I'll leave off with the fact that, again, I, I mentioned my colleague, Will Landau, who was able to join me for the conference. He has now started an excellent collaboration with Kiro Moeller on his, on his Drake package. And they've been in touch via GitHub before, but they, have, they had definitely more than one session where they just sat down and hashed out what could be some interesting improvements, making the package better, dealing with you know, other processes. And it, you should have seen how excited Will is to be able to be part of these collaborations. I'm excited for him. I'm watching as a very interested observer to this. And um, on top of the good news that Will has had lately, um, his Drake package is now part of the R OpenSci project, which is going to do a ton of benefit in terms of visibility, but also developing Drake in a robust way and being part of a more important topic of reproducible research and reproducible analyses. So Will is going strong with that package. But again, this conference was a great way for him to kickstart additional efforts and forming these collaborations with such brilliant people that work in the community like Kiro Moeller. So I'm again, I'm really excited for him to see where that goes. 
So yeah, just the other people I met, you've heard my conversations at this point with obviously uh, Romain Francois, Thomas Peterson. Uh, it, was, it was really awesome to meet Thomas for the first time. And boy, he's, he's, got, he's quite busy too with some of his newer efforts after the conference and meeting some familiar faces as well. So was it, was it worth it? You bet it was. Um, I'm, again, I'm crossing my fingers. I can go next year when it will be in Austin, Texas, which would be obviously great weather there too. Um, but I'm excited to see what they have in store. If it's tracking the way it's been tracking the past couple of years, I'm guessing we'll have even more attendees. And it'll be interesting to see how they balance, you know, the kind of content that we, you know, that we see at these conferences. So, um, again, I have links to all the recordings as well as roundups from others in the R community based on their observations of the conference. Most of them are from people that actually attended it, but there's obviously some that from people that were just watching on Twitter uh, or other venues along the way. I have at least uh, seven or eight of those about that I've linked to in the show notes that you can read for your, uh, you know, reading pleasure. So yeah, that I think is going to uh, wrap up my coverage of our studio conf and probably uh, put a bow on this episode as well. I definitely want to thank everybody for the great compliments, the, the retweets and everything like that for my uh, previous roundups. I mean, I should say my previous interviews in the next episode, I'll probably get back to some of the things I've had in the pipeline for a while that even I would say, I should say I'm even more inspired after attending this conference to kind of kick those efforts off. Hopefully it'll be well received, but got some interesting ideas along the way to kind of look at interesting data sources and figuring out best ways of communicating results and putting more emphasis as well on issues that a lot of us in the enterprise environments have to deal with that may not necessarily be there when you first start using R. And I have nuggets that I've learned along the way. I wish I could share more exact details of the projects I work on, but as I mentioned in the conversation with Ian, there's a lot of stuff that can't leave the firewall, so to speak. But I do have ways of, I believe, uh, sharing some nuggets about how I got to certain end stages or end products that I think could benefit everybody no matter what industry you're in. So before I go, I do have one little bit of admin uh, item to take care of. I am actually switching the hosting provider for the R podcast episodes, and I'm hoping it's a seamless switch. But if not, you can always find the most up-to-date feed on the podcast website at r-podcast.org slash subscribe. And that's where you'll find all the links um, to the various podcasting software to put the R podcast in. But this newer platform I'm going with, I've heard great things about from a lot of the podcasts I listen to on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. And it should make subscribing to my podcast a lot easier and hopefully even more uh, discoverable. So that's opening the doors for a lot of things. The other thing it'll open up is much better formatting of show notes, which I, I uh, those have not come out the way I wanted to in the previous uh, posts. So hopefully that will look a lot better by the time you see this episode released. I think with that, let's put a cap on episode 25. And if you like what you're hearing or also have some additional feedback for me, uh, please don't hesitate to go to the R podcast website at r-podcast.org slash contact to get the handy dandy contact form so you can quickly uh, submit your feedback right there. And I, I mentioned it in a previous episode, but that site is powered by Blogdown now. So definitely uh, check out my GitHub repo for the source of the site if you're interested and in see how I did all that. Um, you can also find on the guest page all of the bios with the guests that have previously appeared on the podcast. So you will now see Ian Little's bio alongside all the others on r-podcast.org slash guest. That's G-U-E-S-T-S. I cannot say that very well verbally for some reason. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to sign off. So until next time. End of line.